Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Jermaine Beckford is in the house. And Mina Rizuki for the first time on Team Talks, mm -hmm. making your debut tonight. So let's start with you. The match we just saw, it literally gave us everything. It lived up to the hype. Manchester City, Arsenal, four goals, a red card, so much drama after. It's been dominating the headlines all week. Yes, all those conversations on the dark arts. I mean... Coming from someone who covers the Italian league, you don't know what dark arts are unless you come to Italy. I mean, there's everything from eating garlic to put off your opponent to bringing on a player just so that you can get six fouls in two minutes. These are the kind of things that we're used to in Italy. And over here, we're talking about really quite simple stuff, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm loving that, eating garlic yeah. to put off opponents. That's, That's a incredible. famous thing with Leonardo Bonucci. Oh, I mean, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. And you remember what Giorgio Kalina did to Saka? I mean, if, you know, we were talking about Arsenal, like, how did they like it when that happened to them at the time in, uh, in the England final against uh, Italy? And that was horrendous. Yep. Now, that's dark arts. <laughs> what did you think about it, especially after? Because we saw that clip of um, Haaland famously telling Arteta to be humble. I loved it. <laughs> Genuinely, I loved it. So... Football at the moment has become really nice and a bit too friendly. And, oh, I don't want to upset the... Vanilla. Listen, vanilla. Listen, it's a competition. Mm. That's what it's about. It's about my team beating your team. It's about us finding a way to get one over on the opposition. And if it has to be a little bit of the dark arts, a little bit of, I'm going to have to trip this guy up or I'm going to have to pull on his shirt a little bit when the referee's not looking, that's what you want to do. You know, that there, that moment there, Haaland, when he picks the ball up, throws the ball in Gabriel's head again, Thomas Partey blocks, him, uh, blocks Haaland off. Haaland gets in his face. Come on. This is competition. This is the Premier League. This is two teams that are going for the Premier League title. They're challenging each other. They know they are the biggest mm -hmm. opposition to each other. Yeah. And Arsenal were down to 10 men. Unbelievable game. They played really, really well. Every single one of those players should be immensely proud of themselves, especially Mikel Arteta, should be imme immensely proud of his team because of what they were able to do against, in my opinion the best footballing team in the world. Mm. They managed to keep them at bay for, 90, uh, for 47, 48 minutes, give or take, maybe a little bit longer, incidentally. Um, I'm just, I love it. I buzz off that. But this, why has it become so polite? Why, why aren't we allowed to have this kind of level of you know, intensity and anger? And isn't this what makes, uh, what makes it a show, which is why we love watching the Premier League? And also exactly. to do that you know, in 10 men without, mm. you know, and they didn't have Rodri, though, to be honest with you, so that maybe simplified oh, things. Oh, Arsenal were down to 10 men. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dark art, kind of just, yeah. it gets me. I think it was Kyle Walker who said it, and I'm like, so what, now Arteta's office is going to be called the Chamber of Secrets? Well, well, what's the, going uh, on? Exactly. And this is the, the counter-argument to that is Manchester City have been doing that since Pep Guardiola stepped in. Yeah. Uh, no, prior to that, actually. So it's not like it's new to Manchester City. They're just frustrated that they're on the opposite end of it. That's, that's all. Yeah, we're looking forward to that encounter, but we are going to move on to Arsenal, who host winless Leicester at the Emirates Stadium. Mikel Arteta has reacted to criticism about his side playing ultra-defensively against Man City last weekend. Sorry? Okay, go on. <laughs> we'll be ready, don't you worry. Um, shall we start with good old injury news? Um, where are you at, first of all, with David Ryan? What are his chances of making... We have to wait another 24 hours. Is it not looking good? Or we have to wait 24 hours to, to see if he's looking good or not that good. Okay. Um, I guess with PSG, not worth taking the risk. Okay. It's not it's risk. It's, right it's, it's about a player being fit and available or, or not. And um, when we have that clarity um, for Leicester, which is the main thing that we are thinking at the moment, is we'll make a decision tomorrow. White and Timber, where are they? Yeah, Julian was able to to take part in training today, so that's that's good news. So he will be available in the squad. And Ben? And Ben hopefully as well. Okay. And um, can you just let us know a little bit on the progress of Mikel Moreno as well? It, I mean, I'm guessing this week is too soon for him, but... How is he progressing? Tomorrow is too soon. The next week we will see. He had uh, partial training uh, today. He's been working so hard and uh, and he's looking good. It's just about the healing of, of that bone and uh, how mature that is um, to expose him to contact, basically. I know you spoke about this on Tuesday. And I know it's five days, but a lot of people are still talking about Sunday's game. Um, after the game on Wednesday, Pep came out and said, that you two texted and that 
there was no damage to your relationship um, after what happened on Sunday. I wondered how you are still able to remain such good friends with somebody that ultimately you want them to fail. Can you explain to us? Uh, first of all, because I love him, I respect him, and I admire him, and I admire his team and everything that he does. And this is a sport. You know, one thing is our profession, this is our personal relationship. If my relation has to be damaged because we play against each other and one draw and the other one wins or the amount of time that we have lost, then I wouldn't talk to him no more. So that's not a relationship, especially a relationship that I consider that uh, both of us have. So a sport, it will never get in my way in a personal relationship, for sure. And is it harder to do that when it is so fiery and when there are accusations from either side coming at each other? Depend if those accusations affect you, it's because maybe that is true. If it, they don't, and you know, and, and, and you show your integrity, and, and you do what is you believe is right, it doesn't have to be. There are opinions, and if you don't like opinions, then you shouldn't be sitting in the position that I am. So I think it's, it's quite simple. Don't take it personal. Uh, it's part of our job, uh, and the things that you really care about, um, make sure you handle them in the right way. And that relationship, I really care about the same with, with a lot of people in that staff and, and players that uh, I spent very important years of my life with them. Does it make it a little bit harder that you were once that side and now you're tied to the other side? No, I think it makes it easier because I know them in very different situations. And when you get to know that person in the good, in the bad, uh, when things go their way, don't go their way, uh, then you understand much better certain reactions. So, for me, it's not a surprise, and uh, and I'm very comfortable with that. Martin Odegaard wrote in the program notes about how he's progressing. Um, I spoke to Kai Havertz this morning, and he sort of talked about how a lot of the players have stepped up yeah. and are filling the voids that Martin has. I mean, he's still clearly around. He said, but they're finding their voices a bit more. I wondered how impressed you've been with how your team have coped with his absence so far and those sort of players that have stepped in that have maybe surprised you in terms of taking on the leadership? Well, if you put me in the scenario uh, before the start of the season, uh, with the calendar that we were given, with the fixtures that we had, with the three away games that we had, and with the amount of injuries that we had to deal with and how we got out of that, I would be very, very pleased, I think. So it's not obviously just with Martin. Obviously, he's one of our best players, one of the, more, the players that have more impact in the team in many ways. But there were many others as well, and the team is coped extremely well because we have an exceptional group. Um, a lot of players are taking a different role in their leadership, in their importance in the team, and they embrace that challenge, and, and I'm really happy for that. You obviously had a kind of physically and probably quite mentally demanding 10 days. You, you look at what's ahead of you now, and I know there's PSG, but in the Premier League, um, home game, three home games, Leicester, a chance to kind of build a little bit of momentum and go back to playing with the ball, maybe? Leicester didn't play out in front of your home fans. As we play with the ball, no? Yes. Every game, I mean. <laughs> so we'll do the same. Well, Kai was saying uh, he didn't really play with the ball. As good he as... Uh, on Sunday, he was saying to me he's quite looking forward to actually mm. getting his groove back. Yeah. So hopefully we we'll get a lot of momentum now. Okay. George and Bibsy? Mikel, hello. I just wondered, on Sunday, we're still, it's Friday now, all these days on, and so many people are still talking about your tactics. And I just wondered what you, what you made of that. On about what? About the tactics and the decision to defend in the way you did. And I just wondered how far we're, we're six days on and people are still talking. I just wondered what you made of that. That I did what I believe it was the right thing, to be as competitive as possible to win the game. And Roy Keane's had some strong comments to say, and Graham Souness in the fallout from, from that match. Um, Roy Keane said it was a bit of small club mentality. Um, Graham Souness said Arsenal had a bit of an inferior, inferiority complex. I just wondered if you'd want to respond to them. No. And just on David Ryan, is it fair to say he's a doubt for, for tomorrow? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, George. Okay, Brutus to Brad from TalkSport. Brilliant. Hi, Miguel. Hope you're well. Um, 
considering what you said about David Raya, it could present an opportunity for someone like Neto tomorrow. Um, I wondered what, what was it about him that made you decide that he was a player that you wanted to bring into the squad this summer? Well, we, we had to react very quickly uh, with the departure of Aaron, and, um, and we had we had him in, in our list for a few years already. Uh, he's played in various countries at the highest level uh, in different roles, and he's always fulfilled it in the right way. And um, I believe he was the right player because, as well, he was in the Premier League, he had experience, and he's someone that we can throw there in any moment. In years gone by, people have talked about Arsenal and said like defensive side of things has been the club's weakness. You fast forward a couple of years now, if you have one of the best defences in the Premier League and world football, apart from hard work in training, what's been the key to, to get this side to be so organised defensively? It's the player's mentality, basically, how willing you are to do certain things uh, when you are out of possession and, uh, and how do you feel about them, you know, if it's... If it's a sacrifice for the team, we are talking and using the wrong words, you know. So if it's adding something special to the team and contributing to that and loving it uh, while you are doing it, then it's something else. Uh, the outcome is very, very different. And obviously a lot of work from the coaches, from the players individually and, and keep developing those relationships. And then it's about building trust as well within the team, within the the squad that uh, in many phases, whether it's in high press, when we are deeper on, on many of the situations that we have to face uh, during games, that we are comfortable to do that. Um, no, a few, we had a few bumps and bruises from uh, from the game against uh, against Everton. A couple of lads didn't quite make it for, for availability for the for the game on Tuesday. Um, everybody um, got through the, the Tuesday game uh, OK. So, um, yeah, the, the boys have been out a little while, including Yannick uh, Vestergaard is um, uh, still not available for the weekend. So we were as we were, really. No, no change from, from the, uh, the last Premier League game. Um, well, if we could just touch on quickly on that, that game at Walsall. You spoke mm. afterwards about the frustrations heard from, from some supporters during yeah. the game. Um, and needing perhaps to earn some credit with mm. them. Um, we all want to feel loved. So does it affect mm. you personally when you hear... Like well, I think, like as a manager, you're never you're never too far away from um, from uh, challenging times, from from criticism. You know, sometimes it's fair, sometimes it's unfair, and that's that's just the uh, the life that you you have to live. And um, and and for me, I've always said, if you if you if you don't like that, then you know don't don't take these jobs in 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 the first place. So um, so. You know, I, I accept that. Uh, I think, um, as I said, I'll just repeat what I said the the, the other night. I, I will always um, try and understand fans' perspective and, and opinions. And, and my first initial reaction is is not to be too defensive. Is is to to see the rationale of why a feeling may be um, the way it is, and then um, um, and then in the end, try and try and do something to do something about it. So, so I'm no different to to anybody else um, in terms of. Um, like I said, never being too far away from, um, from from some questioning or criticism or challenging. And um, if it's at my my door at this moment in time, then it's one I accept. Um, but I but I also see it as in these moments as a, a as a um, a good opportunity to show the real, um, so the real me in this case to show you know uh, how well I want to do here, how um, uh, how strong I am as a character, and and obviously you want to show. Uh, how good you are as a coach as well. So um, um, it's it's easy to to be really visible and to talk a lot when things are going well. I, I think the real um, leaders and 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 strong characters are the ones that that face up to to difficult times. And if if this is one, then you know here I am, and um, you know looking forward to um, um, you know to continuing to work hard and to get ready for these big games that we're playing in the in the Premier League and and trying to thrive on on the, on the challenge of it. So. Um, um, nothing's changed in terms of um, you know getting back from the game the other night and the preparation for um, for, for Arsenal on the weekend in, in terms of our work ethic and our application. I've said every time we've spoke, I say it plays every day. Their attitude and application, the engagement's brilliant. We've just got to try and um, keep building because that's what we're trying to do to to get the results and performances that 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 we want. But um, as I as I stand or sit here now, uh, I've never been more determined um, since I took the job than what I am now to, to, to do well. And um, and in the end, that's what you want to do. You, you know, supporters pay a lot of money. You know, if any reaction you get from, from a supporter is authentic is because that's how they feel about the football club. And you have to respect that. Um, 
I'll I'll never get too too high from from praise, um, and I'll never get too low from criticism. I'll only get motivated to um, to try and improve. And and um, when feelings are, are not as we want them, then I'll take personal responsibility in trying to change that. I want to go back to Mikel Arteta and his comments there, um, just because I feel like all week he's been the subject of this dark arts chat. What did people really expect him to go and do at the Etihad Stadium against 11-man um, Man City when he had one of his players sent off? Do you think he did the right thing? Was that the right approach to go there ultra-defensively? Absolutely. Yes. Look, again, we're, we're talking about Manchester City who create a, a wealth of chances against the best of oppo uh, oppositions with 11 men. Mm. Arsenal were down to 10 men. Why would they not go on a defensive? Why would they not protect their lead? Why would they not frustrate Manchester City as much as they can and, and bring out this so-called dark arts? I think it's genius from, from Mikel Arteta. I, I genuinely do. If he goes um, and says, right, we're going to go attack versus attack, Manchester City are going to blow them out of the water and have a fun time doing it. It's probably going to end up 6-7-8-1, 8-2, mm -hmm. sorry. Arsenal are not silly. Mikel Arteta is not silly. He's looking at the bigger picture long term. Look, if they get a point out of this game, which they did, it's a point closer to where they want to be come the end of the season. But that also says to me that Arsenal are at a different level now. Uh, Pep Guardiola understands that Mikel Arteta, he hasn't got his number, but he knows what it takes to be a Premier League champion because of the way he, he played that game. I don't blame him one bit. Obviously up to the defenders to score the goals in that encounter. A defender as well, Gabriel, scored against Man City and he scored against Spurs. Um, Arsenal and these corners that mm. they seem to have worked out, they have this routine down pat right now, mm. the danger at set pieces. Yeah, they're absolutely a dangerous set pieces. And I, you have to applaud them for it. I mean, there's got to be at one point where you've... It's such a narrow angle that they've got to set it perfectly. And you know that it was a copycat because they had one just before it, mm. which they missed. But then the second one... Every time you see Declan Rice go to the corner flag and you think to yourself, it's going to be another go and they're just going to go for it. And it's amazing how many people can't defend set pieces really as well. One, one thing I do want to say with Arsenal is, is I do think that sometimes people expect entertainment over trophies, you know, and then when you do do that and you do put that philosophy ahead of, you know, I'm always going to be attack based and then you don't win, then you're called naive. You're called as, as lacking that winning mentality. So I just kind of feel on this, on this particular topic, I don't know how Mikel Arteta can win. I don't know how Arsenal can win because people were criticizing them last year when they weren't putting their foot on the gas and, and putting their foot on, on, on the neck of, of Manchester City by really going for it, showing that mentality. And when they do show that mentality, then they're, then they're the raw cards. How do you win? Yeah, been accused for years, I think, of being soft, have Arsenal, and Precisely. now it's, it's the dark arts. Um, just 25 goals since the start of last year from set pieces. Critical now as well with their main creative force, Martin Odegaard, being injured. Mm. Um, but they were still able to create opportunities and chances. Um, now they're having to rely on Gabriel Saliba. Uh, incidentally, another stat for you. I think since Gabriel signed for Arsenal, he's the top defensive goal scorer. So, you know, that just says to, says to me that from set pieces, they're a threat. And that's it. You, it doesn't have to be pretty. It doesn't have to always mm. be through Saka or on the other side, Odegaard or Sterling. Sometimes you, you can go a little bit more direct, go back to front, go put crosses in the box and get the big players attacking it aggressively. Or just, or just give Ricardo Calafiori the, the ball and he can are. show oh, you what stunning. he can do. There what you a, go. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's a goal-scoring defender, right? And he is, if you just let him go and have fun on the ball, he can show you. He, I mean, he already did it. Yeah, unbelievable, yeah. that goal. What a way to announce yourself, uh, Calafiori. Obviously, some talk about Kyle Walker not being given enough time here, but this is the build-up to that goal. Um, first goal for him in Arsenal colours. What a game to do it in. What a way to score. Just sensational, Mina. It was. And... Sorry. Thanks, Mina. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, go, on, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> but that is honestly, no, no, you go for it because you can tell me exactly how that scored as a striker. Um, that's a really, really difficult technique um, he just showed there. Opening up yeah. his body, whipping the ball hard, high over the, the goalkeeper. Really, really difficult. Absolutely fantastic. But going back briefly, very, very briefly, to Kyle Walker being out of position, mm -hmm. he had more than enough time to get himself mm -hmm. in position. 
um, he was more interested and more intrigued in to having conversations yeah. with his defensive players rather than getting himself in position. I, yeah, I just I don't think anyone thought Califuria was going to manage that rocket. Yes. Yeah, un unreal. I want to talk about goal scorers uh, because Leicester go to the Emirates Stadium and Jamie Vardy loves a goal against Arsenal. We can roll back the years and see uh, some of his goals that he scored against Arsenal and he goes back to the Emirates Stadium now. A striker that was once I mean, a link with Arsenal. Yes, and she scored 11 goals in 16 Premier League appearances against them. So we know that when it comes to Arsenal, he's always going to have a shout. But right now, Leicester don't look like a team that can really put together a win against Arsenal with the way that's going. And, and Steve Cooper sort of fighting for the fans to love him. I, I think it's going to be difficult. You always have a chance when you have Vardy. You can tell us how brilliant he is as a striker. But in all honesty, I think Arsenal are just too strong for this side right now. Do you want to ask your question to Jermaine? I'm feeling very, very brilliant <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> but oh, I, I was going to ask me, you this. Instead of asking me the question, yeah. I will let you know that while I was playing for Leicester, Jamie Vardy came in to replace me. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed by that fact because he's a legend of Leicester City. He, he scored umpteen goals. I, I absolutely love the guy. He's hilarious. He's great to be around, great fun to be around. Um, and I wish him all the very best. It doesn't hurt me. <laughs> I love I love football. So I, I want the best for my friends. He is a friend, so therefore Aww. come on JV. Same again, mate. Oh, Beckford, what a nice so are you gonna be cheering on Leicester over Arsenal? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well we will hear their predictions, but that comes at the end of the show. We have so much more to come on Team Talks. Darren Lewis and Tim Sherwood are with us to look ahead on this weekend's action. To look ahead on this weekend's action, look back at look this right. weekend's yeah. action. Let's get this on the right timeline for a start. Mm -hmm. I think we're a bit discombobulated. That was breathless stuff yesterday. Yeah. Look, I know you're emotionally involved in it. Yeah. But it was just it was just one of those proper title challenge, yeah. end to end, thrilling, bit of needle, bit of aggression. It was good. It was just good is what it was. Could you imagine how that would have ended up if we could have had eleven against eleven? Yeah. Oh. Because um, that's what it comes down to, you know, players getting booked for for kicking the ball away. But, you know, I, it was, a, it was a disappointment simply because of that, you know, what he, got, what he got sent off for in the end. And I would look at it from Trossard's point of view. We know that's happened just a couple of weeks ago. So in the current climate, yeah. you know, you, you can't do that. And that's what I was probably frustrated at last night, being 2-1 up and then you're losing a man, knowing what City are capable of. How many games haven't they lost there for? 38? Yeah. I don't know what it is. 48. It's 48. Yeah, see, I tried to dumb them down, but no, 10, 10 <laughs> more it was. <laughs> But, you know, in the end, you know, I, I probably think I'm very happy with the, with the result and very proud of how the boys that handled that whole situation. Yeah, they, they've gone to, to Manchester City and they've, they've taken a point and mm. you would think that that would be, a, across the course of a, a season, that wouldn't be a too bad a result. It's because of the, the late equaliser, obviously, but just a word on the game overall, Tim. It was just a just end, proper entertainment, wasn't it? I loved it. I thought it was really good. I was, I was in, intrigued to see how Arsenal would go and approach it because I felt like they have to go and take three points because don't rely on any other team to take points off Man City because it doesn't happen if you want to win the... The Premier League, you're going to have to go to the, your biggest rival, which is Man City, and you're going to have to win. Uh, there was a lot of talk before the North London derby. You know, if they lose to Tottenham, if they lose to Man City, the season's over. They very nearly won both games, you know, yeah. so they're right in it. They're a different... They're, they're, I think they're made of different stuff now, Arsenal. You know, they've got the best back four, back five, back six with Calavaco coming in there now. He's he coming to the side. I think they're... Um, I think they're title charges now. I really do. I don't think they're favourites. I think Man City's still are favourites. But the needle in the game was really encouraging for me. I just, I really like that. It's a different spice to it. You know, we've seen Liverpool and Man City. It's all about handshakes and cuddles and, you know, who can outplay each other. You know, this is a different needle. It's, it's great. I love it. It's, it, it's a throwback. Um, and long may it continue. It has a, an old school feel to yeah. it, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can think about all of the old bust-ups and battles between Manchester United and Arsenal, Chelsea and Manchester United as well. Um, we're still talking about the spite afterwards. You've got the viral videos of Harlan throwing the ball at the head of Gabriel afterwards. Um, all of the little videos of Harlan being a little bit naughty with his comments towards Arteta mm. as well and a couple of the younger old. players as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so this is one of those ones. You always know a good bust-up and a good rivalry because everyone's talking about that rather than the football days later. But what I think Arsenal did yesterday was send out messages. They send out messages that they're a serious team now. 
no one's ever going to talk about their attitude going to the Etihad again because they could and should have won the game yeah. and would have done if there were 11 players on the pitch. I think it would have been a very different game. I think it would have gone that. the other way. I mean, that's my personal opinion. What, they would have gone to City? If they, were gone, if they would have stayed with 11 men, I think they would have opened up and Man City would have broken down. No, sure. But I might be wrong. Well, no, I do, but just in terms of the messages, I think Gabriel and Saliba, they are establishing themselves as arguably the best centre half period of Premier Although, League. Although, as Roy Keane said on the UK coverage yesterday, they conceded two goals. Yeah, they did. But, but, but I think in the context of yesterday's match, that would be true. The, of what their presence and what they represent, their ability at set pieces and all of that. Because when Roy did say that, um, and I think it was Paul Burson who was sort of really gushing about them. Um, it was uh, Michael Richards. Richard, Michael Richards. Um, and, and, he, and when he said that, it did. I did sit there and think, yeah, actually, you can't really sit anywhere and say they're the best player. But but as a partnership, they're just so outstanding, mm. and they were so unfortunate to leave now to lose. The flip side of that, of course, is that if you don't have the defensive discipline to last at the whole game, then you can make the opposite case for them not being as imperious as, say, Vidic and Ferdinand or Carvalho and Terry, Galas and Terry, so many of the top centre-half pairings who have been outstanding. But I just think about their ability at set pieces and the way that Gabriel rose to head that ball home. It was just outstanding. You know what as well, Kels, when we talk about, like, Roy, because Roy will say something like that and it will vex me, because it has just vexed me. <laughs> I'm probably going to say something, because when you look at how that first Man City goal came about, we know what Erling Haaland wants to do, how he want, wants to run in. The mistakes made before that is totally out of Gabriel and Saliba's hands, where they are and where they've got to go. Look, if that's, where, that's where the game's going to. Isn't, isn't, that what... as, isn't asking for a card supposed to be a book? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. exactly, but this is yeah. where the game's going, Kels. It's a, it's a very specific action. That's you can't right. do this, otherwise... It, but you can do this. When Wright is talking about the warning there, it's not going to come now. The warning is Declan Rice mm. against Brighton. That's the warning. That's what you should have. Mikel will be really upset. He's talking about after the game about it was only a second. It was only a second, only half a second. But them split seconds is what the game gets turned on. You know, decision making. And, and when you lose your head, he kicked that ball away to kill time. He no. just kicked it away. He's out of frustration. That's that what given should a be fact. taken into consideration, surely. Mm. Yeah. The, yeah I think the intensity of the game, all that, Darren, for me. <clears> yeah, no, I agree with that. Losing that. that. I, 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 think, I think, yeah, because you can. Well, some, some of the best man, uh, referees, the reason why some people think they're the best, because they turn around and they say to players, come on, I'm trying to help you here. Yeah. And, you, and they're very demonstrative about that. So when you're watching, you know what they're trying to do and yeah. say. They're trying to preserve mm -mm. The, the spectacle. Yes. Once that sending off happened, suddenly there was no spectacle. Was no spectacle. It, it was, was attack it was against defence for the it remainder was, of the game. It was a, an amazing fight from Arsenal. Well, yeah, but are they fighting a bit too much? That's 17 red cards since Boxing Day 2019. Yeah, but if we're going to go into that kind of stat, Kels, then we have to go back and look at how those red cards came about because... That red card for me, yes, that's not a red card. De you know, Declan Rice. But, but it doesn't matter which law they're, they're breaking. If, they, if they've got more red cards than anyone else since then, does it mean that there is a, a discipline problem? No. Do, do, do you know do it? what I think? <laughs> no, no, it I'll doesn't. Say, no, I'll Let's say no, because, especially, no, girls, only because of what people are getting sent off for now is something that the game has to try to adjust to. You will get sent off for that, Trossard. Declan, you'll get sent off for that. You know, but like, Docker, you could kick it there and then it could come back here, but... You don't have to get... Mm. So, but, where's, but, the, where's the consistency? But I'm less concerned about the, the red cards, only because the last time I asked were that many red cards, it was when Arsene Wenger's team were winning titles. They were a dirty team. Lots of people say that Arsenal have been, oh, in the last, what, 15, 20 years, too easy to play yeah, against, yeah. too powder puff. They're not able to cope. Laws. Yeah, <laughs> son -in -laws, exactly. Yeah. And they were nice boys. And suddenly, looking at them yesterday, they're warriors, they're monsters, they're all over the pitch. Yeah. They're physically imposing. They're, you know, you look at the way they're blocking off keepers for, the, for their, the, for their yeah. um, uh, set pieces. I, and also, there was a long period of time where Arsenal, people would say about Arsene Wenger, he practices. Uh, attacking, but no defence. You know, where's the defensive steel? Where's the edge? Where's the sharp? Mm. Well, that's all there as part of this Arsenal side. And if there are red cards along the way, mm. it means because they are not nice boys anymore, they're prepared to fight and dig in. And if they do get red cards as a result, maybe, but still, they're at the top of the Premier League. But then red competing. cards, they they don't matter they, and, until they matter. Yeah. And what I'm saying, they've had two red cards this year. And if we if we're led to believe that yesterday, if they would have gone to stayed with eleven. We've got an extra two points. At Brighton, 
my belief they would have won that game at home to Brighton if Declan Rice doesn't get sent off. That's two red cards, what could have cost them four points. Mm. And that four points is the difference between them winning the league and losing the league. Yeah, I agree. I think only two points. You still have to look at the week they've had as well. There's all I I, just to to go back to the point, I know you were you sort of being funny when you were saying, you know, it's not a problem with discipline because they're not necessarily vicious Vicious, red cards. But is that not almost more of an issue? Because if actually it's if it's for a hard challenge or if it's for like a you know stopping somebody going through on goal or something like that, then then that's kind of worth the hit. But what what Tim's saying is if if you're getting sent off for kicking the ball away in, because that's your second yellow. Is that not a bit of a you know waste what? of a red yeah, card? I, I, still, I can't get away from the fact the way the game is now and what you can get a red card for. And yes, you, you have to think to yourself, obviously, you're feeling that Trossard maybe saw what happened, so you have, to, you have to kind of relax in the moment and say, right, I could get sent off for that side. Difficult. Just but it's not that easy, especially in the, in the, yeah. in the game, the, the time of the game. Why can't referees understand that side of the game? Where a player has to be in control because... In control because what could happen, the ramifications if he gets sent off, and then the referee treats you like a man and says, listen, yeah. I know the game. How many times a referee put you to point and say, listen, I know there's a lot of people here, we know how much is on the game, you just need to calm down. Yeah. Where, where's that gone? Before the game, Bryce. Absolutely, before and the I game and to, while it's happening. I used to say in the tunnel to the referee, it's a very emotional yeah, game. Yeah. There will be tackles, yeah. both from us yes. and both from them, just keep your cards in your pocket. It's, I used to give them that information when I played. Because I know I'm trying anymore. to make them, educate yeah. them that this is a high-pressured environment today. A bit different. And when it's a slippy surface. Yeah. It's a bit slippy today. Yeah. might be some mistimed tackles. Bear that in mind. You know, the thing I, as well, that, that, that what would happen as well, Kells, is, is if, if people can watch a referee controlling it and say, listen, I know he's got these wrong there, but, but I'm not going to book him for that. I'm going to give him a warning. People are used to that. That can still happen in the game. You can still, as a referee, control a game like that and say, mm. any more... Because we're but seeing that, game. But, I saw that, a game the other day. Giving referees leeway leads to more inconsistency. It's only and so because then of the you get pl- pressure that gets Then you get players going, well, he did that earlier in the game and you didn't book him for that, and yet you've booked me for the same thing. And yeah. there's a. Yeah, because we've set a precedent get... that we're yeah. doing everything to the letter of the law. It can't yeah. be like that. But that, the reason that that's happening is so that referees are. If they apply the letter of the law, it means that they can't be accused of being inconsistent, oh, which is everybody's biggest gripe about referees. Yeah. It's the one we started off with when we, we talked about the second yellow for, for Trossard. You went, well, what about Doku? What about when Sobersai got sent off, or didn't get, sorry, a yellow card for, 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 um, for kicking the ball away with the same ref in a similar situation? Yeah. You go, well, it's inconsistency that is the most frustrating thing, and yeah. the only way referees will say to fix <clears> that <throat> is to apply the yeah. letter of the law. I'm sure the referees want to use some common sense. Mm-hmm but they're not allowed to. Legislation doesn't allow them to. The mandate is you stick to the law to try and get the more consistency. What me and Wright is saying is wrong, but we would like to yeah. see it like that, but it's not... When's it, affecting it's not the game? Happen. When's it's the game? Move is away it affecting from the game? Where, where, you know, like, a referee will book you and he'll go, oh, they're there, over yes. there, yes. over there, yes. over there. We, we had that, and then yeah. we kind of seem to have lost it overnight, yes. haven't we? Mm. I, it's more a question than than I don't know. I... And that's as much for the crowd as anything else. That's great when you're inside yeah. the stadium yeah, yeah, yeah. and you can see it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a kind of communicate. All, yeah. all I was saying was we can't criticise referees for inconsistency no. and then say, but we need to make the, the laws more flexible. Mm. You can't have both. No, One... I don't think you can, no, but I think that they... Like, you, you can use comments and say, listen, you know, it's, trust that, listen, it's nearly half-time. Now, you just need to... Cut. I know the emotions are running high. Any more of that, I'm going to have to send you off. You're already on a yellow. Bam, you understand that. I thought at that stage we're, we're two one up because yeah. again, it was a it was a set piece and again yeah. it was <coughs> a, a strong um, Brilliant. physical presence in the box. <clears throat> and a fantastic ball. He, he, he played one earlier on where it's very strange to me because Pep talked about how good they were at set pieces. And on the first corner, what he he headed over the bar, Gabriel, Doku was marking him. I couldn't understand that. And on the second one, they've obviously said, right, Carl, you, Mike, you mark him, and the ball is so good. Once he's made his move, we saw Carl trying to stop him and that. He can't be stopped no. if the ball is good. And that is what we know we're capable of doing at City. Obviously, scoring a goal what Calafiori scored. We don't normally score off goals from outside the box. I was only saying that the other day. But that was a brilliant goal, which we, you know, we got back in the game because of the referee. Yeah. Right? We got back in the game. But that is what we're capable of. Mm. And that is what we've done. And I think... As much as people saying if it was 11 men, it would say, I still believe that Arsenal and the new Arsenal and the mentality of this, how, how deep they're willing to go, we, 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 I think we beat them. 
I think we'd have beat them. I, I actually... And they were celebrating say, I know their you draw. disagree, but... And they were celebrating oh, their yeah, draw. But this is, this is, this is going back to Rodri's comments from last season, exactly. isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Rodri's saying it, but they, they were celebrating the draw. Because the emotions take over. They know that Arsenal are on their tails now. Arsenal are up for it physically and mentally and yeah. everything that comes in respect to the football. So yeah, they've, they, got I mean, proper, look, they've got a proper... They're celebrating a draw because they've... They played for a draw because City have been cautious. And it's straight back to the Etihad for us. And I want to start by showing you the second half stats. I mean, it's incredibly one-sided, as you'd expect. Arsenal with that, that man less in that second half. But, Farah, if you saw stats like this, you would think that was a, a very one-sided 5-0, 6-0, 7-0 win for that team, wouldn't you? Oh, most definitely. I mean, 88% possession, 392 complete passes to Arsenal. You can see it there. Um, 28 shots on goal to Arsenal's one in the second half. I, I mean, I think the only thing you've got is 16 outside the box and, and Arsenal didn't have any. But the, the, the thing that stands out the most is the, is the, the 1.4 expected goals from 28 shots. That's low yeah. for the amount of shots they're taking. Yeah. yeah, Arsenal, we're always going to struggle, but that's... That's quite low for anybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's an understatement of the year. Uh, I, I think the one <laughs> shot is when Hazard, ha uh, Havertz went through and he actually was right on top <laughs> of Edison and kicked it ag against him. But the thing, the reason why that is, is so low is because the, the, all their shots were such a low XG because uh, Arsenal encouraged them to have plenty of shots from outside the box. Right, let's take a quick look at uh, what changes had to be made in, in the second half. It was Ben White came on the field as right of three centre-backs, meaning a back five. It was Saka, the captain for the day, mm -hmm. that was replaced. We didn't know whether that would mean, you know, they would play a little bit narrower, try and leave one player up front, but we'll show you right from the very first, the very first clip that that just meant that uh, Arsenal set their stall out in that shape very, very quickly, Leroy. And yeah, they certainly did. Look about it, they just left the ball, there was no press, everybody gets back into the shape, the back five uh, into their shape, and then there's a, a midfield four, Havertz came in on the right-hand side, there's a back five, one in the line, and then the, the midfield four in front of them, Martinelli going into the left side, alongside Rice Party and Havertz, who did a great job going back. Well, that's how they started the second half, but mm -hmm. they got deeper and deeper and deeper, and at times it was, as we'll show you, it was six at the back and three in midfield. Then it was seven at the back. I mean, I thought, I, I, we'll see it there, look. Martinelli ended up getting deeper and deeper, and I still thought they were comfortable enough, Arsenal. Yes, they've got, they've got three, uh, three man midfield, and I thought their midfielders worked incredibly hard, but mm. I thought they were always sort of within the width of their own penalty area. I never really felt that City stretched them into these spaces out here very often. Never really asked them to come out of areas that they didn't want to be in. Yeah, and, and I thought that was a perfect game plan from Arteta for this second half because Arsenal know Manchester City like those balls, like to break lines and really thread and hurt centrally. And I think what Arsenal did was compact that central area. And you'll see, you just, you just highlighted it the, if you hold it there, look. Yeah, where the if you if, uh, this is probably the only one that's probably a little bit out. Sorry, well do it from here. Let me undo that. That was that's right. undo that one. Okay, it doesn't want to go on. Do it now. Go on. Go from here. And if you look at this here, how compact they are, and that's the areas that we know Manchester City like to slide the ball through. They're saying to Manchester City take the wide areas, put crosses in. And the reason why they're saying that, because they have two centre-halves in Gabriel and Saliba that don't mind dealing with crosses from wide areas. And Manchester City wasn't prepared to do that. Rod Rodri just said, we, we just heard him, that when they're making these side-to-side -side passes, it's generally just to try and move people around so that they can, they can then break the line, they can then yeah. slip a pass. Do you think that was Mikel Arteta's inside knowledge that was saying, do not leave this space. Do not give up anything, easy passes that break the line. We can drop deep and we can come out to block shots and we can, but we do it from that kind of, that kind of position. You're absolutely right, uh, uh, Leon. And it, his inside knowledge was that when City get in these, into these areas, because we were saying, no, oh, they need width, but he wants his wide players to be in and around the edges of the 18-yard box. You see there, they allowed Diaz to have the shot goes over. But look at Doku uh, it, down, down here. I think it's Bernardo Silva in around here. Pep actually wants them there. You know, back when we played, we want our wingers as wide as possible, get the ball put in the box. But he wants them to get the ball. So when they're driven, they're taking them in the box. Mm -hmm. And they get into the byline, and that produces... The, it, eventually, they got the goal. But that's what Pep wants. No, they don't mind Ruben Diaz shooting from, no. from that kind of distance. Arsenal seem to keep forcing Manchester City into where positions Arsenal wanted to go into. What did 
Manchester City have to do, Farah? What should have Manchester City done a little bit differently? I just felt like they, they would uh, recycle the ball way too many times. I, I, I thought I know you were talking about the, the wide players and Pep lights and Narua. Could they have pulled out and maybe tried to? They started really wide in the first half. Maybe could they have, you know, stretched the, the fullbacks and brought them out and created gaps? But they certainly needed more movement. It's, it's quite static along the back line. You see, if, if he pulls it here. Manchester City, along, it's quite static, so Arsenal don't really mm. have to think about anything. There's no yeah. little darted runs mm. that, you know, in between, it, maybe if we just make a run and try and drop them off without getting, you know, them unselfish yeah. runs we talk about. Yeah. They just needed to be a little bit sharper in and around the box with off-ball movements. Mm. 2v1s, as you, you're highlighting there, wide areas. We didn't see any of that. Mm -hmm. We left wide players to go 1v1 quite often in, in, in the game, and I felt like... if yeah. we, Go on. Also, no, no, you're completely on. right, go on. No, I was going to say, but you, you're absolutely right, right, Fire. But the one thing you notice is that every single Man City player is having three, four, five touches. Mm. And, you know, when, when, you, when you were playing, when Leon was playing as a coach, you'd say one or two touches, yeah. one or two touches. But, but Arsenal, again, in people's faces, there's number one, two, three, one, two, three. And if you know somebody's taking three touches, you know you've got them where you want them. I yeah, think I the think... worst thing, isn't it, when you're a team that is, is, is having to, to be disciplined, not, not jump out, the worst thing is that when teams play quickly, it really makes you want to jump because you get a little bit impatient. The fact that City, as you just highlighted earlier, right, mm. they, they were slow on the ball, weren't they? They, yeah. they? they slowed it down, which actually made it a little bit easier for Arsenal to stay in that shape. What they did do well, Manchester City, is take quick this set part, pieces. Yeah. I mean, they never let Arsenal rest in that sense. When you're taking, when the ball, when you're defending like Arsenal are having to do, when the ball goes out, it's that general moment where you go, brilliant, time to get a breather, time to, to fill your lungs, to to, to, to re, re, reassess yourself and get going in. Man City didn't allow them that, that opportunity. It was relentless in their pursuit of that equaliser. Exactly, and this is stressful. You know, this is stressful to defend your box against Man City for, for what, 55 minutes? It, it is, and, you know, any team, uh, you know, is going to have lapses in concentration. And when they did have a lapse of concentration, David Ryle was absolutely excellent. Yeah. He'd have been very proud of his, of his team, Mikel Arteta, because he kind of forced Manchester City to have their most shots they've ever had under Pep in, in the Premier League. 18 shots from outside the penalty area. That, that's not what Manchester City do when they're at their best. No, and look at, look at the stats. They only won three of, three of those games. Oh, right, Leeds uh, at 7-0. But look, and a lot of those games were up against... I think that was a late winner uh, for Southampton. Lost against Leeds. West Ham, a draw. Uh, uh, Nottingham Forest, a, a draw. So when you get the City to take shots from, from distance... You, you might have a chance of getting something out of the game. And the personnel that are taking the shots. Yeah. Yeah. You've got three centre-halves taking shots from distance. You're quite happy with that. That was key. Diaz no Rodri here, you know, on the pitch. Like, no yeah. um, Kevin De Bruyne would have made a difference. But this, this was the equaliser. They did keep going, Manchester City. And as I spoke about, look at Arsenal players now. It's Havertz is on the floor. It's take a breath. It's let's organise. And suddenly, Grealish, Gundogan, look at, at Jorginho at the bottom. Look how he sees it. Mm. He sees that they've just left themselves open into that position. They nearly keep your flies across, nearly stop it. But John Stones, I mean, look at the reaction from those Manchester City players. That says a lot about how they feel about the importance of this game. Yeah, it's only important just in, not in, in, only in the context of this game, it's important in, in context of the Premier League title race. Because Arsenal go away from that. If they get the three points, they, their confidence is lifted to another level after Spurs and that as well. They still look delighted with the point, but Arsenal would have lifted them to it another a, level. It was a blow considered for Arsenal, considering how well they'd done. But that, I think now is 47 games or 47 Premier League games unbeaten at home. 48 now in all comps at home for Man City, so it was a big, a big thing. But now we'll just see the shots. Look at look at Arsenal's <laughs> shots compared to Manchester City's. The smaller the circles, the smaller the opportunities, and that's what they sort of limited themselves to, or Arsenal limited City to that anyway. Yeah. I like that about Arsenal. I think it showed a completely different side to what we're used to. We've seen a possession-based Arsenal that are exciting on the eye. They showed an ugly side to them in this and a resilient side where they can be together and make it difficult for the champions. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, we'll find out how big a result that will be come the end of the season and that potential big blow of an injury to Rodri. Well, thank you very much to my guests. That's all we've got.